article and talking about the build-up of the bubble. Um, so as you wrote, like Japan was on the verge of surpassing the United States as the world's largest economy, basking in the glow of seemingly endless prosperity. So it's a hard task and a big one, but um, how did Japan get to this point in the first place of nearly surpassing the US? Imagine in the 80s, right? Like today, we, you know, associate this, you know, Asia, we associate China, Taiwan, Korea, even India, right? It's like these, you know, countries of incredible growth and, you know, where the, the growth engine comes. But in the 80s, it was only Japan. Japan stood for all of those things. So, you know, you say the world's factory, right? Today's China. Back then, it was only Japan. The world's most advanced technology, Japan. The world's most efficient labor force, Japan. And the world's growth engine, right? Which we now attribute to India and China, also Japan. And I think, like, it, it wasn't even that far off especially in the 60s and 70s. Like you had companies like, you know, Canon or Honda or, you know, Toyota who just destroyed the Western competitors. Like, I mean, I know your, your colleague, your friend, Asianometry, he talks a lot about Japanese semiconductors, right? In the 80s. And they were, they were truly the greatest. And Americans were just shocked that Japan had like taken that industry by storm out of nowhere. That was really Japan. They just came in and demolished the competition. And I think that held very true. And, and Japan was on a good trajectory, right? up until the 80s. And so in the 80s, things kind of spiral out of control. Like there's many, many reasons for this. Uh, you know, you probably maybe heard about the Plaza Accord. That's like a, a big thing. People should Google it if they want to know more, but things like that made the Japanese government uh, deregulate banks a lot. And also the yen started appreciating at the time. So everything in Japan just naturally got valued higher, right? And as a result of these increased liquidity, and just a super positive sediment that has been going on in Japan at that time for like 30, 40 years straight, right? It was just an uptick in stocks and property prices that accelerated enormously from previous decades. And, you know, in I think what's super interesting here is that with normal bubbles, you know, you see governments and central banks, hopefully, you know, trying to calm the market a bit uh, by increasing interest rates or raising taxes. But Japan, at this time, they were doing the opposite. And then you had Japanese companies flexing even more at that time, you know, like there's a good story of Toyota. They made like um, 50 year forecasts and they started to publicly announce these 50 year forecasts of like how many cars they were going to sell in like 2020, basically, like right now. And at that time, because Japan was so confident and people that invest in Japan were so confident, like they believed it. So they were like uh, GM, they do like five year forecasts, right? While Toyota does 50 year forecasts, like, of course, they should be valued like 50 times more. And so they, all these Japanese companies got valued into the heavens, right? And so I think you have, you know, you have foreign investors being super positive, Japanese investors being even more positive, and then the government cheering you on, like saying like, you should be even more positive. We're gonna make sure to make it even better. That just turned Japan into like the craziest bubble in history. And I mean, if you do you wanna hear some statistics of how crazy it was, yes, I, I know yes. it's some down. I love it, yes. <laughs> so, so first, um, 13 of the 20 most valuable global corporations in 1989, right? At the peak of the Japanese bubble, they were Japanese. So more than half of the 20 largest companies in the whole world were Japanese. And then on top of that, the, the asset bubble, so the property prices, you know, we talk about 2008 as this you know, horrible time in the US, but in the early 90s, Japanese property prices were almost valued doubled of American property prices in 2008 in the largest cities. So the bubble was basically twice as big in Japan as 2008 US, which is just, it's unfathomable, right? Yeah. And it's, it's like stories of, um, I, I, one, one fact I really love is that, so, you know, Japan, it's, it's quite a small country, especially if you're from Australia. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I read somewhere, it's like the size of uh, California, I think. Mm. And all the land in Japan was worth more than all the land in the US at its peak. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. And just like the Imperial Palace, right? Mm. Just the Imperial Palace in Japan, which is like a couple of football fields big. You like you can literally walk around it in like an hour, half an hour. That place alone was worth more than California. <laughs> oh my God. So it's just, uh, you, you don't understand, like people were insane, right? Like yeah. when you say it out loud, you're like, this is, how does it even work? But that's literally how crazy Japan was at the time. Yeah.